1 Kings 16, 29 to 34. Hear the word of the Lord. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel. And he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. As we looked at this scripture, we, we are hearing about all that's taking place and, and j- this city that's being rebuilt. But before we get to the rebuilding of the city, we need to ha- step back and look at the history of Jericho. Jericho is a city that was built in a strategic place. It was topographically located so that the, uh, the travel routes went across the, how the land was laid. And Jericho was at a place where you could go east or, w- east or west or north or south. I need to make sure to get my hand signals right here. And so this putting a town here was strategic because it helped serve as a way stop for travelers. And also, well, if you're going to charge tariffs, and charge for people to come through as a way to make money. It's considered, even today, the world's longest continually populated city. It is called the City of Palms. But actually, the name Jericho means new moon, which is, we'll find, we'll find out that there's a meaning for that in just a moment. It was built and then rebuilt in the Canaanite fashion. And if we know anything from your Bible studies, the Canaanites were very heathens. They were just, they were very hedonistic. They were very, very much into paganism of all sorts. And the city was built like that. We come to the city, to the later the thing most of us know most about is Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. I mean, there may have been even a couple of songs about that. Some of you may have heard of them. There's even this VeggieTale version, don't ask me to sing it. I'm not going to. Yeah, but this is the first city that the children of Israel faced when they entered the Promised Land. Jericho was, was questioned about what they would see and what they'd find out. So Joshua sent in some spies to find out what was going on. And when the spies got there, They found out the people knew that God was with Israel and they were coming to take Jericho. Now, I don't know about you. If if I'm standing somewhere and, and somebody says, hey, you're actually standing in the road. There's a car coming. Get out of the way. What should I do? Get out of the way, yeah. Standing there is not a good idea. Now, if I stand there even longer and look and say, Yeah, you're right. There's a big semi down there. And it's getting bigger. Now, whose fault is it that I got hit? The driver, right? You know, no, it's mine. But only one person, Rahab, surrendered to God. They knew God was with Israel. They knew they were coming, and their solution was... Let's be like a turtle and just sort of pull everything in and hope we live. This was the God that wiped out and had destroyed Egypt, which they had known about. This was the God that had parted the Red Sea, which they had also heard about, and parted the Jordan River, which they had heard about. 
and they thought they could hide in their own little city and they'd be okay. Of course, the city was taken by God. And, then, and the city was, it was to be God's. All the spoils from Jericho to, were to be God's. Because God had done the work. In fact, at one of the most interesting and most fascinating stories, I think, uh, probably I'll be, I would be willing to bet that uh, Pastor Dennis has preached on a few times, I know I have, is the story when Joshua is considering taking Jericho, and he walks out with his, out, and all of a sudden he's faced with the angel of the Lord. And he falls down before him and says, are you with us or with our enemies? And I'm going to paraphrase it. You got the wrong question, buddy. I am with the God's army. The question you need to be asking him, are you on my side? Now I'm paraphrasing that big time. But basically God's saying, I am here and I'm the one in charge. And Joshua, of course, submits to the Lord and follows his command and does the dumbest thing anyone can ever do. Wear out your army before the battle. March around once a day for six days. On the seventh day, march around seven times. Whew. And then blow the trumpets and holler and, and stare at the walls. That's, that's not strategy. Unless God gives it to you. And the walls came down. And as Jericho was taken, in the scripture we read about it, Joshua gave the word that the person who rebuilt it would have rebuilt it at the cost of his firstborn at the setting of the walls. And when the, the gates were finally done, it would be at the cost of his youngest. And most people who read that think of it as a curse from God. God's going to kill the person's sons who, of the man who does this. But as we look at it, we might want to know that maybe there's something else going on. Joshua is actually more of a prophet than he is one who's just giving a curse. And the Jews often look at G as Joshua as being a prophet. After the city was destroyed, they came into the possession of the people of Benjamin. The people of ben Benjamin rebuilt a Jericho, though it wasn't at Jericho, it was across the way. So in this east-west path that's there, the old Jericho was on the north side, and they rebuilt on the southern side of it. And this city became like a city of refuge. In 1 Chronicles chapter 19, verse number 5, we see that David sends his men there. They have been he had sent a good deed to someone to, as saying, hey, I've been, a, it had been put, place, put in place as a king. Your father was on my side. You know, well, let's be friends. And the king was, was threatened by David. And he took all the men and cut their beards and hair all in half. So they were like, really didn't look good. I'm, I'm looking out here at Jeremy and I'm thinking, I'm picturing him with half of it missing. And he, he might not be, be willing to come up here and read for us if he had looked like that. I don't know, maybe he might, I don't know. But David sent his men there until they were, were able to come out and not feel ashamed. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, 28, there's talks about the school of the prophets being in this new city of Jericho. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 19 through 22, Elijah purifies the water there. So we see there are good things happening in this city. 
In 2 Chronicles chapter 28, 15, we find that prisoners are cared for at Jericho, at this new city. But then come along Ahab. Ahab, as we, we heard read today, was a horrible king. And some of you remember stories of Ahab and Elijah confronting Ahab and Elisha confronting Ahab. And Ahab was not, was, if there was a way to do corruption, he perfected it. It's like, let's sign the most heathen king in the area and let's marry his daughter. Let's set up temples for Baal everywhere. And even after it was made clear that Baal was not God, that God was God, Ahab kept doing it. He kept supporting his wife, kept doing horrible things. And during this time, Halil decides, I'm going to rebuild Jerusalem. He rebuilt it at, at that northern old set, setting. And because of it being there, he would have the first chance to greet anyone who was coming through the area as far as for trade and things like that. In other words, he was the first one to exploit them or to take advantage of them. Something interesting they've discovered at Jericho through archaeology is that in this town, the town was built, like I said, in the, in the way of the Canaanites. It was supposed to be meant to sort of set up as a sort of an example of what the moon like, should look like in one of its phases. And throughout the city of old Jericho, there are, there are places they see temples or, or shrines to different phases of the moon. So the city was built to, to worship the moon, and actually the city itself was built as a sense, a temple to the moon. And when it was rebuilt, it was built in that same fashion. But since the city of Jericho was supposed, the old city, was supposed to have been dedicated to God, God did the victory, God got all the spoils, it all belonged to God, how do you take something from God? I don't know about you, I think it's a bad idea. But Halil had a way. There's a Canaanite god called Chemosh. And Chemosh was one that could take over something. And he would sort of, could sort of serve as a step in to stand in between you and the other god that you're trying to appease or trying to stop from interfering in your affairs. And Chemosh took human sacrifice. Child sacrifice, even. Around the city of Jericho, under the rebuilt walls, we find evidences of graves. So it's very possible that God did not kill Halil's children. He curled his own children in order to keep God away from his new city. And considering the Canaanites and the way they did things, it makes perfect sense. And there was this idea also that if there was a grave there, it kept away the good God. Because, of course, God can't enter a, an unholy site. So just put a graveyard there and that'll keep God out. I know we all know that's, that's a dumb idea, but it was a pagan thought. It's kind of like the, the reverse of holy water. People get that idea, you know, I've got holy water, I can keep evil things away. Oh, God keeps evil things away, the water doesn't. 
But they have that pagan idea that if we just do something, we keep God away. So the words of of Joshua were not necessarily a curse, but a prophecy of here's what's going to come. The person who's corrupt enough to try to take this city from God will sacrifice his oldest and his his firstborn and his youngest to rebuild so he can get ahead? Wow. Wow. I don't know about you. I'm going to go back. I'm not willing. Now, I've only got two. My, my oldest and, and, well, actually, my, my oldest and my firstborn are two different ones. But the, anyway, it's a long story. We'll get into it later. I only have two. I'm not willing to give them up. But even if I had 20, I wouldn't be willing to give up two of them. No matter what. But to do it to get ahead so I can make money, so I can become more prosperous, what a price. What a price to pay. And yet people are willing to do that all the time, aren't they? Sometimes they don't actually sacrifice their children or kill them but they treat them in such a way like they're not even there just so they can get ahead. And it's a great, great cost. But of course, by the time Jericho comes later, Jericho in the time of Jesus, these two cities have sort of merged. It was a place of corruption, of greed. It was not necessarily a good place to visit. I mean, think about the areas maybe of of Muncie that you probably wouldn't want to visit at night. That was Jericho. Jesus gives the story of the Good Samaritan. The man goes down to Jericho and falls among robbers. Yep, that can be expected because they hung out in Jericho. We talked about before about Jericho was not necessarily a good place. And the thing about it, though, even in spite of this, we see Jesus is willing to visit. Because here's the, play, here's the thing. No matter how bad things are, or how broken a place is, or how much a place is, is, is fallen into corruption, or is fallen into decay, Jesus is willing to save. I never, I never advocate deathbed conversions because you may die before you have a conversion. But why would God give that option? Why would God save someone on their deathbed? Because he considers them worth it. For most of the people, Jericho was not a place you went. You didn't go there, you didn't invest money there, and you didn't send friends there. Yet Jesus visited. In fact, we find even Jericho was not a place that was well received. Even Barnabas, who was blind, was thrown outside the city to beg. Not even really welcomed in. But something happens at Jericho. And here's the thing. When Jesus is allowed to visit, things can change. In Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 9, we find Jesus visiting or seeing a man called Zacchaeus. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there named Zacchaeus, he was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see Jesus, who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus 
When Jesus spot, reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zachariah, or Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, 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 here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the account. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and save the lost. Jesus goes to see Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus is the lowest of the lows. We've talked before about how low you thought they thought tax collectors were. They were traitors. They were working for the enemy to exploit you, to pay your taxes. And the way that tax collectors made extra money was they charged extra. And it was more like the mafia than it is like taxes. And how the mafia do things. They'd come in with their thugs and say, it's time to pay your protection money. And if you don't, Bubba here is going to break your legs. And then we're going to let the other guys take care of your shop. So are you going to pay today, or are we going to have fun? That was the way tax collectors did things. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. In other words, he hired the lowlifes who went out and did the work. So this is like the chief mafia boss. This is the head of the family. Now, I don't know about you, but if we had a mafia boss in town, and he's beating up people and treating people wrong and ripping people off, and even the local police department is scared of him, and I'm going and visit him every week and having dinner with him, how many of you might think this is one, one kind of strange behavior? Some of you might think, why are you hanging out with that guy? What are you doing there, preacher? Well, that's exactly what they said to Jesus. What are you doing there? Why are you there? But see, Jesus didn't see a sinner. He saw a son of Abraham who needed to be redeemed. Jesus didn't go with Zacchaeus just so he could go to a party. Jesus went to Zacchaeus' house because he knew that God had worked in his life and he was ready And Zacchaeus got up and said, I will give half of what I, everything I have to the poor. That's a big deal. I don't know about you, but how, much, how many are willing, you willing to give up half of everything you own? And then on top of that, he says, I'm going to pay back four times whatever I've stolen from people. That might have been quite a list. He must have had a lot of money. We don't know how much he had afterwards, but he was willing to let it go. I want to point out something here. Why would he give back four times the amount? Because the, the law, the Old Testament law, said if a thief was caught stealing, he paid back four times the amount. And Zacchaeus was saying, I want to do what's right. I want to fall, go back under the law like I, like I was supposed to be as a son of Abraham. I want to pay back how I've done and for what I've done. And a change took place in a life that no one else would have believed happened or would have been possible. What happened after that? We see Barnabas, of course, being healed. And though this is not recorded in Scripture, something seems to have happened in Jericho. Because this city known to have a place of exploitation, a place of greed, a place of 
vile things happening. When the Romans came in in 70 AD and began to, to sat, prepare for the siege of Jerusalem and then destroyed that city, refugees fl fled and they were welcomed into Jericho, protected, fed, and offered comfort. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't see that happening in some of the, maybe like I said, some of the worst areas of Muncie, places you wouldn't want to go. If all of a sudden tragedy takes place, how many think you want to go down to those worst areas? Uh, no, that would be adding insult to injury, right? It would be if it hadn't been for Jesus. Because God changes things. God does new things, sometimes in new places. But let me tell you something. Like we've seen here, God likes doing some new things in old places and in old lives. For some of you, that may be really good to hear. Because maybe you feel a little old. But God is willing to do new things. In places that have been broken. In places that others might say, why do you want to do anything there? Because God cares. Because God loves. Because God sees people not as just the broken things they are, but as children of God that He can redeem. And redeeming the old and the broken is just what Jesus does. It's what He does. And I'm grateful for that. This last year, we, were, we had the uh, first meeting of our new Global Methodist Church. And a lot of these churches that, be, that are joining the Global Methodist Church, they're old churches. But well, we've, we've said something. It seems that God is starting to do a new thing. What all is he doing? Don't know, but it feels like God's doing something new. And to me, it's like, that's just a reminder that's what God does. He takes things that other people might look at and say, eh, why bother? Just throw it away. But God says, no, I can redeem that. I can change that. I can do something there. And all it takes is a people willing to be like God. Zacchaeus, willing to seek Jesus and embrace the change he calls for in our hearts and in our lives. So let me ask you something. Are you going to let Jesus do something in your life today? Are you willing to let him do something new? It may not be easy. It may call for you to give up, maybe not money, but it may feel like it would have been easier to give up half of what you own than to give up what Jesus is asking you to give up. But let me tell you something. When you do it, Jesus will build something new within you, something good within you. And the world will see it. And the world will know Jesus has been there. Let's get ready to sing today. We're going to sing today all the way, all the way my Jesus, my Savior leads me. And that's what we want. We want our Savior to lead us, to guide us, to direct us. Because let me tell you something, he'll build something new in us if we'll let him. Oh, Father, I ask that you be with each one as they leave this place today. 
May your spirit go with them. And Lord, we ask, build new things in old places. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you and go with God. Thank you.